Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The rate of deaths of young people on the streets of urban Britain from stabbings and shootings is heartbreaking. But how to stop it? Is this just a question of money or a more tangled and difficult one about when and why police use their stop and search powers? Angela Rayner, the Shadow Education Secretary, joins me from Salford. Angela Rayner, good morning. Good morning. Is the Labour Party position really that all these deaths are the result of austerity? Well, I mean, it's devastating to see the amount of deaths on our streets. And as you rightly say, this is not just about London, but we've seen knife crime increase in 39 of the 43 police forces across the UK. And it's not just about austerity, but I think when the Home Secretary sticks her head in the sand and suggests that losing 21,000 police officers off our streets doesn't have an effect, then I think that's a very naive position. And we've seen cuts to youth service, cuts to education, cuts to children's services, and all these wraparound services that we know support our young people in growing older and making sure they make right choices, I think has a knock-on effect. So it's not just about police, of course it's not, but it's about the wider public service and about us supporting families to make the right choices. I mean, since 2010, overall crime has gone down. Um, you, you rightly mentioned youth services, but um, can I ask you therefore whether Labour would replace the, the, the money that's been lost for local government for such services? Well, we said we'd put an extra 1.5 billion a year into um, so, council services. And of course, that would be up to councils to decide how they use that. But we've also committed to making sure we have a statutory youth service. I mean, I worked in local government for many years, and my husband was a youth worker. And I remember the tremendous work that they used to do in our communities. In fact, I was one of those children yeah. that used to follow the van and get the chocolate biscuits from them and their advice and support. And it's a lifeline for young people that are often on the streets for many right. hours needing that support. Um, this is the problem now. You're offering 1.5 billion, which sounds like a lot of money, but it's only 10% of the cuts to local government budgets that this government has made. If you were really going to change the situation on the ground for local authorities up and down the country, you'd have to offer a great deal more money than you are at the moment. Well, we've also committed to ensuring that we'd replace, uh, we'd lost 1,000 sure start centres under this government. We've lost 21,000 police officers. We've lost a billion from our Would children's you services. Those well, we said that we'd put 10,000 police officers on the streets, and of course, we have to be fiscally responsible, Andrew. So mm. we would reverse, start to reverse the cuts and an end to austerity. Because what we've seen in this country is those at the top have been doing well, whilst we've seen crime mm. on our streets increasing, recording crime is up. Up. We've seen people fearful of going out on the streets. And when you see our children being stabbed to death on the streets, that is a time where you've got to say, Absolutely. stop where we're going and move forward on investing in our young people's future. So there is a big and genuine dilemma about stop and search. On the one hand, we know that a lot of black kids feel very, very angry about the way it was used in the past, and that even triggered riots back in the 1990s and 1980s, the sus laws and so forth. But on the other hand, a lot of people are saying that now it's gone to the stage where the police cannot stop and search people. Kids can go out carrying knives or guns and feel that they won't be stopped, they won't be caught. And therefore the thing needs to change. What is your position on stop and search? Well, there has to be a balance, Andrew, and evidence-based stop and search is the right way forward. It's part what of the tools. What does that mean, evidence-based stop and Well, it and means search. that, you know, the intelligence that we get, if you've got local police forces and neighbourhood policing, which was a triumph of the last Labour government, then they know their communities, they know where these gangs are, they know those children that are vulnerable, and they target those areas, not just with the police, but working with youth services, social services, and community and health workers right. to ensure that, you know, we know who those children are and we target them rather than target, targeting on ethnicity. Well, it's in terms of targeting, would you agree therefore with Trevor Phillips who's saying this morning there are parts of Tottenham where there are serious gang problems where the police have to be allowed to stop and search people on the streets even if they don't think a crime is about to be committed for the sheer deterrent effect of stopping kids going out with blades? 
Well, like I say, you, you have to have evidence based, so it's targeting stop and search rather than just going randomly around saying, I, I think you look like you might be a gang member, so therefore mm. I'm going to stop and search. It has to be a balance. And if you've got the rest of the community services, youth workers on the streets as well, working with young people, you tend to know which of the kids that are okay. vulnerable or potentially at risk of that. Right, we're coming up to the local elections. Your party's faced a lot of problems over anti-Semitism, and this was something that you yourself warned about back last autumn when you said, no more jam tomorrow, I want some hard actions to be taken about this. Have you seen hard actions and are you satisfied with what's going on? Well, Jeremy's been quite clear there's no place for anti-Semitism in our party, but I've been a little frustrated that we haven't moved forward on the Chakrabarti report as fast as I would have liked to have seen. But Jenny Farnby, our new General Secretary, has made it her number one priority, and we need to make sure that the full Chakrabarti report is implemented and that we have an absolute zero tolerance. Because, Andrew, it can't be right when people see on social media, and it's not just in the Labour Party but across the board, anti-Semitic rhetoric, and they see no, no action taken or that action is far too slow we've yes. got to make sure procedures not only protect those sure. that are you know allegations are made so, but enforce that people's right to live in a country where they're free from racism or anti-semitism absolutely right and you say Jeremy Corbyn has said that there's no place in the Labour Party for this kind of thing so let me ask you about Thangham Debonair your colleague from Bristol West who attended the protest against anti-semitism outside the House of Commons went back to talk to her party in Bristol West about it she was shouted down and she was hounded out of that meeting. Surely she was treated disgracefully. Well, I wasn't at the meeting, Andrew, but what I can tell you is Thangham is an absolute credit to the Labour Party and has actually been working with me as the opposition whip to ensure that we hold the government to yeah. account for the bursary cuts that we'll have a vote on that in Parliament very soon, which is very important to sure. people across the UK. So Thangham's doing a fantastic job. She shouldn't be hounded out of any meeting. We're, we have debates in the Labour Party, that's quite okay. fine, but she's you... absolutely right to be able to protest and Jeremy's made that clear as well. He's made that clear, but um, I wasn't at that meeting either but I was able to read the motion that was put to that meeting and it talked about it said talking about anti-semitism when people see inequality ecological disaster and war alongside the accumulation of unprecedented wealth in the private hands of a few it's reasonable that they seek out explanations what does that mean if it's not a grotesquely anti-semitic trope well, again, I didn't write that motion. I would no, potentially but. see some of the issues with that is the inequality that's growing in the UK and people's focus on feeling quite annoyed about that and wanting to do okay. something about it in a broader sense. I mean, I wasn't the person that wrote the motion, but let's be absolutely clear that there's no place for anti-Semitism well, in the party, but there is a place for fantastic local MPs like Thangham Debonair sure. who's getting on with the job of protecting the most vulnerable in society. And she was shouted down in her own party meeting when that kind of motion was put to her. Do you think Bristol West a Labour Party should be suspended by Jeremy Corbyn because it's doing exactly what he said shouldn't happen? Well, Bristol West Labour Party, I've, I've, I was over in the South West just this week talking about children's centre closures that the local council have implemented and the cuts they've received from central government. I think actually what they need to concentrate on is highlighting the devastating effects on our communities of this Tory-led government right. on our local okay. councils. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us, Angela Rayner. Let's Thank turn you. to some of those same com uh, questions with the Community Secretary, Sajid Javid. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Good morning. 50 people killed in London so far this year in stabbings. And it's not just London, is it? I mean, across the country, knife crime up, I think, 21%. Uh, all sorts of violence up across the country. Are we facing some kind of public uh, safety crisis in Britain? Well, I mean, first of all, so many personal tragedies there. Your know, lives yes. lost, your people that won't reach their potential. And it's absolutely right that we focus on this both nationally and at the local level. Mm. It's worth uh, recalling that crime overall has fallen significantly yes, but over I want, the last I want, decade. I want to stick to the stabbings and uh, the shootings. But, but, the, but the, I, I agree with, with your main point that we have seen a rise in the last few years of serious violent crime. Right. Now, well, there's no... I think people often push for one single cause. There isn't one single cause. It is a complex issue, so it will require action on many fronts. That means dealing with the root causes, of course. It means dealing with having better early intervention. Now, that's something the Home Secretary will talk to tomorrow when she unveils the government's okay. new serious violence strategy. But, but something but also very grave is happening in this country. Let's just look at the figures that we've got. Um, so this is across England and Wales. Murder up 17% compared to the last year. Crime up 21%, knife crime up 21%, and gun crime up 20%. This looks like, to many people, a genuine crisis. It, of course, some of that would 
be down to better reporting. But of course, there is a real increase. That does not explain the whole issue of the recording. There is a real problem here, and especially over the last three or four years. We have seen a significant decline before then, and now we're seeing a rise. So question is, you know, for government, you know, what are we doing about it? So the Home Secretary will announce... You're not enough police is what so, you're doing well, about but it. First of all, let's, let's, let me go through, if I may, just because there's, mm. there's a many complex issues here. You know, first of all, the, the Home Secretary tomorrow will announce a new serious violence strategy that will focus on the root causes and uh, also on early intervention. But also there's a role to play for law enforcement and that's what we're announcing today. And this is this is just the kind of okay. thing that will make a big difference just with the new serious just, weapons okay. bill. Just explain exactly what this new law is going to mean. Well, so it's a serious weapons bill. We want to bring it forward very quickly within a few weeks and if we get cross-party support, I think it will become law very quickly. It will make it illegal for anyone to possess asset in a public place without good cause. It will make it illegal for under 18 year olds to buy acid. It will also deal with some of the issues around knife crime, so it would make it illegal for anyone to order online a knife and have it delivered to a residential address. And it will also uh, look at, uh, it would also make illegal the possession in private of certain weapons such as the so-called knuckle, uh, knuckle dusters and the, uh, uh, and the zombie knives and these kinds of weapons that have because, been I mean, used. I mean the problem with this to a certain extent is every single kitchen in the country more or less has a lethal knife somewhere in it. So there's no shortage of knives in this and, 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 and this isn't, this is about you know, making mm. our country safer, making our streets safer and taking action. Yeah. There's no yeah. reason why any, okay. anyone, whether it's a kitchen or not, needs a zombie knife or knuckle dusters Com and also there's an action against corrosive substances. We've seen a rise all, all in the, all of these of this acid attacks All of this too. is great, but can you tell us, roughly speaking, how many fewer police there are in England and Wales now compared with when you took office in 2010? Well, there's about 15% fewer police officers, but that's also your, your, the, the point, you're, trying, the point you're trying to make there, and um, that was made earlier in your earlier interview, it, it doesn't hold up against the facts. If you go back, go back a decade, Serious violent crime was a lot, lot higher than it is today, but so were the okay. police numbers. So for anyone to suggest that this is caused by police numbers, it is not None, up Nonetheless, by the there are fewer police on the streets, and that must have something, in a common sense way, that must have something to do with it. I'm not well, an expert well, the in it, the the and the nor evidence, are you. The evidence doesn't suggest that, well, but that said, we recognise there are pressures on police. Of course there are, there are all sorts of pressures. That's why from 2015 we protected police budgets. There's a, there's a okay. settlement for police funding which you uh, provides... You cut 1,000 police last well, year. The, the, what we, we provide the funding and so local police then to make decisions how best to use that funding. But okay. we're increasing police funding by some £450 million in the coming year. And the settlement for the Met Police, for example, which by the way has more police per head than any other police force in Needs the country, almost them. a quarter of yeah. the police in the country, they're getting a £2.5 billion settlement and they've got over £200 million reserves. So I don't think but this idea that it's got nothing to do with police cuts for year after year after year, as I say, I'm not an expert, but Ian Blair, the former Met Commissioner, certainly is an expert. Let me read you what he said on the radio this week. He said, if you take 20% of the Met's money away, something gives, and the thing that's given is neighbourhood policing. And that's true. You go around London, you go around most of the country, you don't see police on the streets. And that must have something to do with the ease with which gangs are able to gather on street corners in, particular in rival areas and attack each other. Must well, do. Well, the, 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 let's, we have to go by, the, look at the facts. The facts are that we had much higher numbers of police 10 years ago and much higher numbers of violent crime Not so so numbers. we did tiny, we did tiny, go tiny back increase. go back 10 years and the the numbers were far higher overall criminal offenses they've come down from something like 19 million a year recorded offenses in 1995 to something like just over 5 million last year it's the lowest number on record all, all, all since offenses, those records I'm, began yes, i agree with that but I'm, I'm not talking about that i'm talking about the violent offenses on the streets Cressida dick the current head of the met says we're stretched we're stretched we're stretched She's not, she's not kind of crying wolf, is she? And that's why we're listening to Cressida Dick. She's doing a good job. And, okay. and that's why you need to listen to the professionals. And that's why the Metropolitan Police are getting an increase in their settlement, access to more funding. But she's also talked about police power. So earlier you talked about stop and search. One of the things we're also announcing today mm. is uh, we're going to consult on extending the powers of stop and search so that if, if, if someone in, the police believe someone's is, is in possession a... of acid with no good use in public, then they will be able to stop and search. 
but it's still going to be the case the police have to think that a crime will be committed before they're allowed to stop of course they need to are you going to change that so of course they need to act in the law and in, and in the past what are you when, changing the guidelines in any way for police on stop and search uh, the, the, we haven't changed the guidelines in any way ever, you know, since 2010 what we've done the, the, the law that that covers stop and search hasn't changed because we've had some voluntary people think agreements that it's too difficult for the police to stop well, and we've search. had what Cressida what, Dick says that they've been kind of slightly intimidated by political correctness that when they see people down the uh, coming down the down the street towards them that in the old days they would have stopped and searched they no longer do and that allows kids to go out carrying knives not being as scared as they might have been that they'll be caught when Theresa may was home secretary what she wanted to do was rightly make sure that when stop and search powers mm. are used that they are used within the law if you take 2013 just one exam one year police inspectors they found that the independent inspection service found that 27 percent of stop and searches were done illegally the police, like everyone else, need to act okay. within the law. And if they believe the powers need to change, then they will rightly talk to government. And as we've shown today, we will listen. And if we need to extend those powers, that's exactly what we will do. Boris Johnson has called um, the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, the Kremlin's useful fool this morning. Do you think that's suitable language for the Foreign Secretary to use at a time of national s crisis when it comes to our relationships with Russia? Well, the, the, there's no doubt when it comes up against this issue with Russia that we're having, this very serious issue, that Jeremy Corbyn has let the British people down. There's no question about that. But this is, this, this, well, this, this is a much bigger issue than any one individual. I mean, let's, let's look at the, the facts here. There's been an attempted assassination on British streets with an illegal chemical weapon that we know is manufactured in Russia. That's what we know. And it, it, it is the fact that Sergei Skripal is now apparently able to talk. Is that a very important moment in this investigation? Will this change things now we're able to talk to the Skripals? Well, that's, I, I, first of all, I obviously I welcome the fact that, uh, that he's better, his daughter is better. Mm -hmm. I think it will be an important moment if he can give more detail on what he believes has happened. Mm. And, uh, but that's for the police investigation. But one thing we are absolutely clear on, there's been a lot of talk about this this mm. week, and there's been a lot of misinformation and lies from the Russian government again and again. We're absolutely clear. There's no other okay. plausible explanation Why than Russia being responsible for okay. this attempted assassination on British soil. Why are we not allowing the niece, Victoria Skripal, to come to this country? And why are we not giving the Russians access to Julia and, and Sergei Skripal? The Russians have every right to ask for access to any Russian but citizen, but, no it's up to them, but, it, but it's up to that citizen to decide if they want to meet the Russian authorities. And you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the Skripals don't want to meet the Russian authorities. And the cousin? Why is she not being allowed to come here? Well, let the cousin make an application and we'll consider it. All right. Thank you very much indeed, Thank Sajid you. Javid. But first, the surge in knife crime in the capital has brought tragedy to communities across the city. And in questions too over who bears the blame for the violence and a culture that is turning young men into killers. Uh, joining me in the studio now is the community activist Stafford Scott. Stafford, good to see you. I mean, just in terms of the way in which this is being reported, a surge in violence in London. I mean, it, some people are questioning the statistics, but working in the communities you do, are we getting more violent? It would appear so, that they're getting more violent, using violence more often, and that the outcome of the use of that violence is more tragic and fatal. Why? That the police say it's not a crisis. No, the, yeah, it's, the, the, it's quite amazing. Why is it happening? Why is it happening? It's because in 2011, the Prime Minister Cameron and the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, stated that they were starting a war on the gangs. They then had to create those gangs. They said they were starting a war on the gangs because of the gangs' involvement in those summer riots. Four reviews, including the Metropolitan Police Service's own review, said that there was no evidence of gang orchestration. Cameron and Johnson then went on to help to create those gangs so that we could have the narrative, so that the, the narrative that they gave us could then appear to have some kind of justification. When, when you say that they, they, they created the gangs, I mean, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, clearly there were criminal gangs operating in London before um, Boris Johnson became <laughs> mayor of London. There have been criminal gangs cr operating in London since before John Peel set up the police, which is why John Peel set up the police force. There were some groups of young people that we may consider to be gangs. But post the riots, what the government did was redefine what it takes to make a gang. When I was growing up, I heard about the craze and such. I learned about mobs of people who made up gangs. Today, this government is telling us that three youths can be a gang. 
I have two brothers. I come from a place called Tottenham. That means that these people today would define my, myself and my brothers as being members of a gang. Once you're stereotyped as being a gang and stigmatised, you're just pushed out onto the streets. But, but you're clearly not uh, suggesting in any way that, you know, drugs are not linked to the violence that we're seeing in the streets of London. Let me be absolutely clear. This has nothing to do with drugs whatsoever. Nothing to do with drugs. Right now, there is a war going on in Harringay between young people from Tottenham and young people from Wood Green. That is nothing to do with drugs. It's fueled by their way, the way that they tend to use social media more than it has anything to do with drugs. But ultimately, it comes from the pressure that this state is putting onto these young people. These are children, and the state is using every single agency that it has in its partnership to deliver or not to deliver services to stereotype, stigmatise and criminalise these young people and they're acting out as a result of it. It's not acceptable. Those who are personally responsible should be held to account. But the state needs to stop doing what it's doing because it's criminalising our community. But, but not everyone who, who is part of those communities is behaving in this fashion. Absolutely and, and whilst there is, And whilst there is, so whilst there are a number of very legitimate historical reasons for the black community in London to be, to be fearful of the police... You know, I, I come from a part of the world which is no stranger to violent crime, which is no stranger to drug abuse. You know who the dealers are in your community. Oh. You know who the people with the guns are in your community. You know who the people with the knives are. And I wonder whether or not those people who are saying, look, the police have alienated us, who have, have acted against us for so long, whether that community is doing all that it can to, to tackle this type of crime. What can that community do? One of the things is that what we're seeing at the moment is all of the state agencies coming together and making decisions. They do not engage with us. They don't talk with our communities. You're going to have ministers on after this programme who, if I wait outside for them, are going to phone the police and say I'm harassing them. They'll run away from me rather than engage with me. So they don't talk to our community. So you, so so they you don't can't think get the, that so you, do, so, so you don't think, actually, the, the significant cut in police numbers that we've seen in the streets, not, not just of London but across the country, that that cut has not, that, that, that cut has not had an effect, has not do, led to this rise in violence. Do you, no, do you really, and do the policy makers really think that the kids are sitting at home this morning watching this programme to learn that there's fewer police and then thinking as a result of that we're going to go out there and do something? It doesn't matter the numbers of the police, it's about the pressure that the state, the oppressive state, is putting on these young people that's making them respond in the way that they are. But what, what response can there be to the violence that we're seeing? And it is a significant upswing in violent crime. We can say across the board that crime has come down over the past decade, but in terms of violent crime, there are some worrying statistics. What, what response to that does not involve the police? The police have a role to play. But this isn't only about policing, and that's the problem. Local authorities, central government, the mayor's office have all reneged on their responsibility to these young people. There's no safeguarding, there's no proper recognition that black kids are the victims as well as being the perpetrators. So all we get is policing, and the only response we get is that kind of response we got from Cressida Dick yesterday, which is, we're going to be harder and we're going to put more out there, which is going to cause more response and but, reaction. But why then is it, is it wrong for some people, and, and they have done this, to identify this as black-on-black uh, as -black crime, that whilst there is this, this rage and this anger amongst the, the, the young disaffected communities that you're talking about, that rage is not being directed against, you know, posh white men, you know, in the streets they're, of, they're, they're, in the streets they're, of they're, London. They're Instead, it's being directed against their they're, very own, the people imploding. that they are most like. They're young black men killing other young black men. They're imploding, Neil. But the problem is, is that people gave it a tag a long time mm. ago, and that's when they wanted to start to deal with it differently from how they would have dealt with it if it was just people, young people killing young people. Because they identified it as black-on-black -black crime, what they've started to do is just bring in punitive responses. In, in previous years gone by. So when we had the skinheads, for example, mm -hmm. the skinheads were committing crime against other white people. They didn't call that white on white crime. They said it was a working class sub youth culture. And that then meant that we responded to it differently. There's a range of interventions. When they dismissed it as black-on-black -black crime, we got an Operation Trident, a unit that is as racist to the core as any racist unit that we've ever seen, and that very same unit now is the gangs unit. And that's why we have this predis predisposition of just looking at young black kids as gangsters. Stafford Scott, many thanks for being with us. Thanks for the opportunity, sir.
Uh, well, well, let's stay with this issue and uh, raise some of those points uh, with the Shadow Crime and Policing Minister, Louise Hay. Ms Hay, a very good morning to you. Um, I, I just want to pick up on something that Stafford just said there a moment ago, that actually, in terms of this spike in, in violent crime that we're seeing at the moment, that actually it might not be all attributable to the cuts in policing. What's your assessment of what's going on here? Well, of course, um, the spike in knife crime isn't solely attributable to the cuts to the police, but undeniably, if you take 20,000 police officers off the street, then that ties their ability to be able to respond to knife crime. And crucially, it's also taken neighbourhood policing off our streets. We've seen countless neighbourhood officers taken away towards doing back office functions or responding to crimes when, they, um, when they're committed. And that reduces their ability to prevent crime in the first place. The last Labour government said set up safer neighbourhood teams. It created this model of neighbourhood policing, which is the absolute bedrock of how we do policing in this country, and allows our police to police by consent. And that's what enabled them to build up trust in communities, to gather intelligence, and to prevent crime from happening in the first place. So, of course, those cuts to policing have, have hampered that ability to do that. But it's not just cuts to policing. This government has also cut youth services, have cut early intervention, have cut prevention services, and all of that has led to a breeding ground for knife crime to, to rise. But, but just in terms of going back again to the interview you just had with, with, with Stafford there, I mean, it is pretty clear that there is a long-held disdain for concern about the, the, the police force and with, within some communities here in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom. I, I mean, how best to try and uh, redress that? How best to try and get these communities back on site so there isn't this them-and-us mentality, which does appear to exist in large tracts of uh, inner-city uh, inner England? It is a huge problem. I used to be a special constable myself in Brixton, so I know this um, only too well. And that's why we've been saying that we need to take a public health approach to tackling knife crime. We can't arrest ourselves out of this problem. We can't prosecute our way out of this problem. And we've got a fantastic example on our doorstep in Scotland, which used to be one of the most dangerous countries in the developed world, one of the most violent countries in the developed world. Last year, they didn't have a single young person that was um, killed through, um, through bladed weapons weapons or through knives and that's because they took a cross-governmental approach to tackling knife crime. They worked with health, they worked with mental health, they worked with schools and early intervention. Yes, it's led by the police but it worked across governments like this and it led mentorship programs in schools looking at why um, young people carried knives and why they were using them violently against each other. We've not had um, a, a research program in this country since 2006 as to why young people are carrying knives at school and in their um, in their home lives so we don't know what the impact of austerity or indeed um, of the changes um, around social media have had on why young people are carrying knives and that should have been there in today's announcement from the government on their serious violence uh, strategy but again we've just seen um, a criminal justice response to the problem we've not seen anything about prevention or early, early intervention and we're not seeing anything about putting back in place those programs or indeed learning any of the lessons from Scotland and that's what we're saying we would do differently if we were in government right now. Well, well actually, I mean, the, the situation in Scotland is rather more complicated than that. Yes, it's absolutely true to say that the number of deaths from knives have come down incredibly, uh, but actually, if you are in the kind of the bottom end of the socio-economic spectrum, you still remain most at risk of, uh, of violent attack. I, I just want to raise a point, though, that Trevor Phillips, the former head of the Commission for Racial Equality, has made. You know, he says that the, the problem is quite clearly not in white-dominated middle class at leafy Surrey. It is in black communities in the inner cities. And in those areas, because of the problems that we're seeing with violence, it demands a tougher police response. Mm, I mean, I can understand what he's saying, but from all the evidence we've seen, um, a tougher approach on things like stop and search um, just doesn't... Um, it doesn't bring those communities back round. It does increase that attitude of them versus us. And actually, in New York City, where they all but abolished stop and search, um, they saw the number of violent crimes reduced. Now, I'm not saying that we should do that. Uh, I use stop and search as a special constable, and I think it's an important tool for tackling knife crime. But I do think it needs to be on an intelligence-led 
basis, it needs to be done properly within the law and it needs to be done proportionately. I don't think rushing in with a blanket approach um, in these areas will help um, improve trust and confidence in the communities. But we do need uh, the police on the streets, we do need a visible police presence. I welcome Cressida Dick's uh, announcement that there will be extra police on the streets this weekend, but we need to recognise that those are not additional police officers. They will have been removed from other tasks, they will have been taken off rest days, they will have been taken off other areas, perhaps of investigation. The police are struggling like they have never struggled before. And not only have they been cut, but the demand on their time is at unprecedented levels, not just from rising crime, but from having to deal with responses to issues around mental health and other vulnerabilities as other public services have been cut. So the police are really struggling to fight this problem with at least one hand tied behind their back. Just in terms of, I mean, again, on, on stop and search, I mean, it was, of course, you know, Theresa May back when she was Home Secretary who, you know, pushed forward a reduction in the, in the use of those powers. I mean, I wonder what you make of the, the government's response as, as outlined today, you know, banning under-18s carrying corrosive uh, substances in public places, you know, stopping the delivery of knives to, to, to residential addresses. I mean, both of those things would go some way uh, to dealing with the problem, wouldn't they? Of, of course, and, um, you know, it's a welcome um, step, but we've been calling on them to do exactly this for some time now. We asked the Home Office to bring in a proper licensing system for the sale of corrosive substances. They failed to do that. We said that we would support them in Parliament last year about making acid a possession offence and improving these uh, powers around stop and search. So they've really been kicking the can down the road on these issues. And as I say, we've seen nothing today around preventative measures for this issue. It's all about cracking down uh, at the criminal justice end of things, which, as we know, just doesn't solve the problem. So, you know, welcome baby steps today, but we're still a long way from really getting to the root of this problem. Is it incorrect uh, for some, as they have done, uh, to identify this as black-on-black -black crime? No, uh, clearly there is um, a huge issue in, in our uh, black communities around knife crime and... Um, there are issues around the way the media report it, I think. You know, we do see um, lesser media coverage of these kind of, kind of crimes. We do see a lesser reaction to them. So I think it does now, with the scale of the problem, in London in particular, it needs um, concerted political will from government, uh, a cross-party approach working with our mayor in London, but crucially... Um, a, a a public health approach to how we tackle this. As I say, we can't solely take a criminal justice one, as we're seeing from this government. It needs to be looking at the reasons why this crime occurs um, and working with offenders um, and working with communities in order to tackle it. But clearly there, are, there is a major issue still of trust in the police and working with the police in these communities, and that's what needs to be addressed. Louise, many thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, let's turn to our, our main story this morning, of course, the surge of knife crime in London. Uh, we're joined by the Crime Minister, uh, Victoria Atkins. Very good morning to you. Uh, let's just dwell on the numbers here. 51 fatalities in London this year as a result of deliberate killings. <coughs> Excuse me. 44 deaths in the first three months uh, of 2018. The comparison with New York has been made by many people. What's going wrong? Well, first of all, our thoughts must be with the families of those affected because it is the most horrendous crime. It's certainly beyond my imagination and we're doing everything we can both to um, help the families but also to stop this violence. Uh, and uh, so today we're announcing the uh, launch of the Offensive Weapons Bill, which is a bill that we've asked the police, the CPS and others for um, what they think they need, what extra powers they need to try and stop the scourge of this violence. And tomorrow the Home Secretary is announcing our serious violence strategy, which is an all-encompassing uh, strategy to deal with serious violence and to stop kids in particular from picking up knives and acid in the first place. Yeah, but my question was, mm. I mean, what's, what's going wrong here? It is fair to say that over the past decade we have seen crime coming down, yeah. but certain forms of violent crime, I mean, it's ridiculous. In the year ending, even if we don't look at this year's statistics, the year ending September 2017 in England and Wales, knife crime up by 21%, gun crime up by 20%, possession of an article with a blade or a point up by 35%. I mean, this is happening on your watch. 
you must shoulder some of the responsibility. Well, we know that some of the increase in the reporting is down to better recording by the police. But you're not um, suggesting that there I'm hasn't been a spike in violence? Absolutely not. I'm not right. suggesting that for a moment. And we know that um, there's been genuine rises in some of these crimes. There are a whole host of um, factors. Uh, we've heard from the Met Commissioner about the impact of social media with um, some of these videos that wind gangs up uh, to retaliate very quickly. Uh, we know that um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the we want to stop the assumption amongst some young people that it's normal to carry a knife, which is why we've had the knife uh, free uh, campaign, which uh, Sky very kindly featured a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of factors, and indeed the serious violence strategy tomorrow will show um, the impact of drugs on violence as well. We know that's having a huge impact. So it's, uh, we've got to have an all-encompassing solution to this. I mean, it's, it, it's strange that you don't mention, for example, policing numbers. I mean, frontline roles are down by 14% between 2010 and, uh, and 2017. You're telling me that that's had absolutely no... Uh, that there's absolutely no correlation between that uh, and the increase in serious violence? We have to look at the evidence, and, um, you know, a great deal of thought has gone into this, and we, we review it constantly, but we know that in 2008, when there was a spike, a similar spike in knife crime, there were many, many more officers on the beat then than there are now. So it's not as simple as just putting it... as just talking about police numbers, but so of why course... why is put 300 extra officers on the streets then? Well, of course, um, it's down to chief constables and to uh, police and crime commissioners, or the Mayor of London, to uh, decide what's best on the streets of their locality to tackle this. Now, you know, I fully support the Commissioner in taking that decision. If that's her assessment on the evidence, looking at how it's panning out across London, of course she's got to do that. Mm, but again, Sadiq Khan uh, offering £15 million extra funding to try and tackle violent crime. You have to concede that over the time that the Conservatives have been in power, we have seen a significant reduction in police numbers, we are seeing a significant reduction in the amount that is being spent on policing. And I think the Met has to find an additional £400, £500 million pounds of saving by 2021 22 it, it, that has to have had an effect somewhere. We, we've looked at the evidence very carefully and um, we know that with uh, police officer numbers and with funding over the last um, several years that knife crime has fluctuated in that. So uh, whilst I don't for a moment, you know, um, ignore the point of police officers on the streets and so on, it's not the only um, answer. And this is why with the Offensive Weapons Bill, we're, we're giving the police the powers they need and also that charities, people who work with young people, tell us that, you know, there are areas that we need to improve on in terms of making sure the police have the powers. Yeah, I mean, but key also amongst that must surely be funding. I mean, stuff. social care funding's gone for that. Funding for youth workers and centres has gone for that. EMA, that's gone. General austerity. I mean, clearly, there is not enough money, and there is not as much money in the pot as there once was. But surely we should be prioritising the spending in places, for example, in youth services. Surely we should be prioritising uh, spending there ahead of other things. Well, that's a matter for local councils, but we... Uh, well, they don't have the money to do it anymore. But as government, we invested uh, two, £920 million on the Troubled Families programme. Uh, about a month ago, I launched the Trusted Relationships Fund, which uh, targets those children, those young people who are most at risk of being exploited, who have been let down by every adult in their life. Uh, and there are also other measures. For example, um, the Knife Crime Community Fund. We had the first tranche of that in the autumn, whereby we've asked small local charities to put their bids in and we've handed out uh, uh, 765,000 pounds to help them deal with their with their work very locally in, in their local communities. We're announcing the second tranche of that in the spring and another up to a million pounds to help them. So there are many ways of tackling this uh, and, and we've got to you know we've got to give local chief constables and local police and crime commissioners the flexibility to deal with issues as they see fit. What may work in one part of the country won't necessarily work. Okay, they're, they're, they're you're talking about giving more freedom to, to police and crime commissioners. You've also talked about the role that social media companies have to play. You've also talked about the role that, that, that drugs clearly have mm. in all of this. At the same time, the Conservatives have been in power since 2010. And I go back to those statistics. Knife crime up by 21%, gun crime up by 20%, possession of an article with a blade up by 35%. 35,000 offences in, uh, in the year ending March 2017 involving a knife. It is your responsibility Ultimately, it is your fault. Well, overall crime, of course, has um, decreased over that period of time. But uh, also, I'd, no, I challenge you with um, saying it's our fault. The, f the responsibility for it's someone not, it's not picking up—no, no, 
know, but the, the responsibility, what we are saying in the Knife Free campaign and all our work when we, we're funding young people's advocates in uh, major cities across the country, we're working with uh, charities such as Red Thread, which intervene at, in A&E departments, so they get that child, that young person at the teachable moment. But we want to make it clear that, you know, we have to, as a society, take responsibility for this, that we want to stop those young people from making that terrible decision to pick up a knife in the first place, because if they pick that knife up, it can have terrible consequences for other people, but of course themselves as well, if they do very bad harm with it. Victoria Atkins, many thanks for joining us. Thank you.